So uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Dr. Jay Simon Rowe, and on behalf of uh, the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, webinar uh, addressing um, Michael Jordan, uh, globalisation, and uh, where we are in the world. Um, these are uh, you know, issues that have been brought to a head by the production of the Last Dance, and I'd like to. Uh, take this moment to say thank you to a couple of people who've made this all possible not least my co-collaborator in chief lindsay krasnoff who i'll pass on to in a moment uh, and also uh, ashika doshi and jacob loose and fadil uh, who has been uh, stalwart in organizing this facility so thank you very much to everyone else Thank you to all of you for joining us wherever you may be in the world i'm mindful we probably span i think all continents in this discussion um, already and numerous time zones so whatever time of the day it is with you thank you very much for making the effort to, to join us um, I'm not going to speak for too long because um, you didn't come here to listen to me but to be part of a discussion so I'm going to pass on to uh, Lindsay for just a brief welcome on her behalf Thank you. Hi. I thank you, Simon. Um, it's always a pleasure to find new ways to collaborate together, especially on, for me, a very exciting topic, basketball diplomacy on its globalization and, uh, you know, the, the, the airing of the last dance and how it's very quickly become a global cultural phenomenon um, provided us a really wonderful um, window of opportunity. And I thought it would, you know, uh, behoove us all to um, weave in some interesting angles to help uh, learn a lot and put some of this discussion into greater context. Um, just to kind of give a brief overview, I'm a Celtics fan. I grew up on the Boston Celtics, so I do not come to this discussion as a Chicago Bulls or Michael Jordan um, uh, fangirl, uh, but it, it's really interesting in that, you know, watching the, the last dance and thinking about Jordan and context ticks off a lot of really interesting questions that uh, particularly our invited speakers and then um, also some of you who I know who are in this um, room today. I hope to learn a lot from you and your views and perspectives on this. One um, kind of administrative thing to take care of at the outset um, thanks to Ashika, we'd like to do a little bit of a capture exercise while we're on here today. Um, so using the chat function um, right now before we officially fully kick off, if you could type one word that comes to mind on your thoughts about The Last Dance, Michael Jordan, or Jordan's global impact. And then at the very end, we'll ask you to do it again. Um, Maybe a different word will come to mind, maybe not. Um, and Ashika is going to capture this and we'll use it in our post-event wrap up. Um, so that, that's it for me on the administrative side. I'd like to turn the mic over first to Alex Wolf, who will kick us off on our kind of global, looking globally um, at our topic today. Alex is a contributing editor and writer of Sports Illustrated and author of The Audacity of Hoop. Um, he's had a long career in basketball, um, covering it around the globe. And um, Alex, I will pass it off to you. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, before I did The Audacity of Hoop, I worked on this book uh, called Big Game, Small World, A Basketball Adventure. And there was a comment that Barack Obama made uh, right at the end of episode 10 of The Last Dance about how Jordan and the Bulls projected American soft power that sent me back uh, more than 20 years to when I began working on Big Game Small World and flew to Beijing and was met there by a lovely guy named Xu Ji Sheng, who was the host of China Central TV's NBA show called Basketball Park. And everyone in the country knew him as Big Xu because he was 6'4 and he also had size 13 feet. And a couple of years prior, he'd been in Salt Lake at the NBA Finals where he met David Stern and he told David Stern, in a few years, China could be your second largest market to which Big Shu told me with great pride, Stern said, it should be the first. Um, and Shu explained to me how basketball had long ago been embedded in the country's DNA. Uh, China was among the first countries um, that those freshly trained missionaries from the YMCA training school kited off to with their Bibles and the rules to Doc Naismith's new game. Um, with the Army's founding in 1927, it was already the most popular game among the troops and by the time of the Cultural Revolution, 
basketball was so well established that even as the music of Beethoven was denounced for being Western and bourgeois, basketball got a pass. Um, until the terror of the, the Red Guards ended in 1976, though, players on the national team didn't dare be a star, she told me. If a player stood out too much, coaches would call an emergency team meeting for him to be denounced by his teammates for daring to exhibit, quote, the unhealthy American imperialist style of seeking headlines. Indeed, up until the year before I visited, so this would have been the late 90s, the Chinese League did not even keep individual statistics. So into the center, Michael Jordan. Now, in Mandarin, the ideograms and the, the transliterations that indicated Jordan's name were this, which is the... Uh, the ideogram Chao, Q-I-A-O, which means skillful or clever or ingenious and has connotations of honor or honesty. And the other half of it, conveniently enough, the three letters we recognize as the back half of Jordan, Don, which is a term for medicine that suggests a miraculous power, but it's also a verb that means to shoulder or to carry a burden. It has connotations and associations with the color red, which of course, in addition to being the bull's uniform color, uh, has associations in Chinese culture of action and celebration or authority. Anytime you get a passport stamped in China, it will come in red ink. So the Chinese could essentially sound out Jordan's surname while conveying in their own tongue the very attributes that they were venerating him for. And as Big Xu told me, you'll notice that people never talk about his statistics, only about Chao Dan's technique and spirit. So through the 90s, just as Jordan was shedding the role of this prodigious, prodigious individual score on a very mediocre team and began to mount the throne of the Chicago dynasty, Deng Xiaoping, the premier, was proclaiming this new China open to the West in new ways. So to get a sense of why Jordan was so special at this time, I walked Big Shoe through several other NBA players to find out why they weren't as highly regarded as he was. And I asked him, what about Shaq? And he said, yeah, he's too big. And Rodman, he's too immodest. And Allen Iverson, well, a lot of young people, students, they like him because he's clever, but he never passes the ball. And Chinese people think he's, he's violating the rules because he dribbles so high. So I think I was catching on and I said, well, what about Grant Hill? He's a great player. He's really humble. And Shu cut me off. He said, Chinese people say Grant Hill lacks the quality of a king. A star must have the regal quality of an emperor and must behave as if everything is under his control, as if he's unwilling to obey anyone else or have anyone overtake him. If there's anything, by the way, in the last dance that we got out of that about Michael Jordan is that is who he was. And Xu added, his team must be at the top. In Chinese history over 3000 years, every emperor had his dynasty. So with that as background, you can see why when I turned my TV off a couple of Sundays ago, I was transported back to China 20 years ago. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Alex. A good start indeed. Um, if we can uh, press on a little bit, um, then Cynthia, might we turn to you and your experience? Don't forget to unmute. If you unmute. Technology, we're trying to get used to it. <laughs> Is that better? Absolutely. Um, great. Hi, hi everyone. Um, it's evening here. It's about 6 p.m. in Nairobi. Um, wow. So, you know, Lindsay, you just asked what word do you think about when you think of, you know, The Last Dance and Michael Jordan? And this took me, you know, way back when I started playing basketball about 20 years ago. I had, before I was a sprinter, um, pretty good at if, 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 if I can convince myself. Um, I went to high school, they threw me into the hockey pitch and, I, and I, I, I ran away immediately because, you know, I saw guys with injuries and I went to ball. First day I, you know, I threw it in um, it went into the into the hoop, and I was like, "Man, this is you know, this is what I I want I want to play." We grew up at a time where uh, 
you know, we didn't have so much access to the TV. Um, national TV would come on at 4 p.m. Uh, between 4 and 9. Um, and we only had access to basketball. Um, the NBA program, NBA action on Sunday afternoon at uh, 4 p.m. And everyone around me, you know, we used to play all these kids' games, but at 4 p.m. on Sunday afternoon, everything stopped. Every little thing stopped. 96, 97, Jordan was really Jordan. And I, I, I have to say, even me sitting here this moment, if I didn't have that experience with my basketball, I probably would have turned up into something else. And it's a, it's a conversation that I hear so often with a lot of the basketballers in my generation that, you know, Jordan was so influential. Um, a couple of days ago, I, I had a conversation with a, a, friend, a good friend of mine. His name is Hisham Alamrani. He's the former CEO of CAF. So for those of us who do not know, CAF is um, Confederation of African uh, Football. So this guy, Bas uh, brother, football goes through his veins. I mean, all he thinks about is soccer and soccer and soccer. So I was telling him about, you know, this conversation that I'm coming to have today um, with, with all of us uh, around basketball diplomacy. And his light just went up. He's like, oh my goodness, Michael Jordan was everything in my time. Now remember guys, this is a guy from Morocco. He didn't have any access to basketball apart from that time. And he insisted that I don't remember watching basketball again after or during i mean after or before that um the way i used to dress at that time was because of what i was watching with um you know with with the nba and with michael jordan um we do not have direct access to you know like nike um i'll say first hand we call it second hand we Thrift, you, you call them thrift shop. Between the 96, you know, 1996 and about, I would say now, it's amazing how if you walk in, do you have your thrift shops? If you, you guys, if you go to a football game, if you go to water, when I look at the young guys who are coming, is absolutely incredible. People go to thrift shops, secondhand, you know, Jordan. Now, this is a guy in Nairobi who you would very rarely ever think that, you know, would, would have this conversation. You have WhatsApp groups of young guys talking about the last dance, talking about, you know, greatest. But these conversations are going now. This is a part of the world where you wouldn't probably expect it, but it, it, it's ingrained. It, we don't have a culture. And you ask a 12 year old who probably didn't have the experience of Jordan, what's, what do you think about, um, about basketball? He's going to tell you um, the usual. LeBron James, but when you ask him about any other basketballer that you know, any other of the older basketballers that you know, the first name that always comes is Michael Jordan. So it's it's um it's you know it's a real honor to have lived through that time, um, and the influence is absolutely great. Uh, we are now talking about you know the Basketball Africa League uh, setting up and and, and being launched uh, any time shortly uh, and unfortunately because of COVID, we, we, you know, we had to have that canceled um, uh, or postponed for that matter. But even in that conversation at the launch, Jordan was, you know, Jordan is and Jordan was one of the, the, the main faces of, um, of, of this particular league that's coming up. So he's thoroughly influential in Africa. People know about him and, and it's, it's 
we're, I'm certain that in the next couple of years, or you know, if, even within this period, that after after the launch, there's definitely going to be a lot of conversation, and his influence is great. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Thank you for persevering through a few connection uh, challenges there, as part of the uh, um, joy of this particular forum. Um, but thank you. I think it's interesting to ponder the influence of Jordan, a uh, generation of. Africans who never saw him play and yet today there's still that discourse yeah. um, surrounding um, To move on if we may uh, to another um, time zone certainly Haresh Hello Over to you sir. Thank you um, Good evening, actually it's uh, 1130 in Kuala Lumpur right now and uh, Eid Mubarak, or as we say it in Malaysia, Selamat Hari Raya Aidil Fitri. Uh, thank you, Lindsay, for the opportunity and uh, good meeting you, Dr. Simon. Now, um, I'm glad Alex um, raised or pointed out the uh, China element um, in his opening speech because basketball isn't exactly a popular sport in Malaysia. In fact, this sport is predominantly played by the Chinese community for decades. Uh, in fact, um, Teachers from China had introduced the sport to Chinese school in what was known as Malaya uh, in the early 1920s. There were small numbers of uh, non-Chinese playing the game, but the surge of interest was seen during the 80s and 90s. And that's thanks to the exploits of the uh, Chicago Bulls team and obviously uh, Michael Jordan. Now, this was an uh, era where there was no social media, no cable TV in Malaysia. So enthusiasts had to rely on newspaper reports, traded VHS uh, tapes, um, just to catch some of these matches. And uh, come to think about it, um, I think it'd be easier to support the uh, English football team rather than the Chicago Bulls. But that was the impact and that was how the team um, resonated to Malaysians. Now, I don't need to speak about you know, how great the team was or you know, the lasting impression MJ has created upon all of us. Um, I, I think that's, that's uh, evident in so many ways. But I need to stress uh, this, that this team of really talented players and their really good branding exercise defined the childhood and the lives of many individuals in Malaysia. Now, why do I say this? Is because there are different races in Malaysia and they had another thing in common through basketball. If you, wore, uh, if you wore an Air Jordan or a number 23, uh, 23 sorry, jersey, um, you'll automatically get noticed. And Malaysians were further enlightened uh, to the American culture, to its music, to its lifestyle, through basketball. And the popularity of uh, the Bulls and also MJ had indirectly allowed the US Embassy in Kuala Lumpur to embark on more sports diplomacy programs, uh, especially through basketball. You know, we've had quite a number of uh, programs like the Sports Envoy program. Uh, we've seen an NBA CARES basketball clinic held in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, we've also seen some of the uh, former Bulls player like Dennis Rodman, for example, play exhibition matches in Kuala Lumpur, uh, particularly in 2012 and 2013. Now it's amazing how one team and one man can create such a huge impact uh, onto the lives of so many people across the globe. And um, I recorded the views of several individuals who have seen MJ in action, although MJ has never been to Malaysia. I mean, as a professional player, that is. Um, but yeah, um, these people have seen MJ in action at the 1992 Barcelona Olympics, for example. And um, I ended my article on 2213 with a quote from the FIBA Asia Secretary General Emeritus, Yochu Hock. And I would like to end my five minutes here with what he said. That was the beauty of MJ and the Chicago team. They were ambassadors of the sport, the American culture and the lifestyle. It is thanks to icons like them that the status of the sport was raised to new heights. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Harish, for bringing your perspective from uh, Kuala Lumpur. And thank you so much for staying up uh, into the night with us. Um, and <laughs> um, so in opening up the, the conversation to uh, other colleagues, we wanted to just uh, think about what Michael Jordan and his impact on globalization from 
uh, wherever you may sit in the world, what's your uh, impression? Um, if we use the flag facility, we'll be able to sort of come to colleagues in turn. We'll do our level best to get through everyone. I'm sure colleagues have a lot to say. So if we can uh, open up, who would like to um, start the conversation? I perhaps want to throw one out then for you. If, if as a you know young uh, teenager in the UK, particularly short teenager as I was, um, still am to a degree, um, what Michael Jordan meant to uh, me, I recount a conversation with my grandfather, um, a Second World War veteran, who was convinced that Air Jordan was the national carrier of a country he'd served in in the Second World War. And it took us a lot of, uh, you know, convincing that uh, Air Jordan was actually the brand. So in this instance, and I share it, you know, the personal anecdote, for one, that the brand preceded both the athlete and the sport in the context of the, the Roe family discussions. And I think that's one of the important functions of this is where does, what's the access point to Michael Jordan in a globalizing world of sport? Um, during the course of the 1980s and 1990s. Where does the uh, connection, where is the connection made? And ultimately because there are so many different points of conjunction, if you like, it allows for that um, broader engagement. But I share that as a opening gambit. Any, who would like to, Tom, please. Uh, thanks, Simon. Um, uh, um, fascinating discussion to listen to the back and forth from around the world. And I think for me, uh, as, a, as a sort of a, a basketball fan and player when I was growing up, probably actually at the beginning of the Jordan uh, time with Chicago, and I'd sort of moved on, you know, I was at university when, when this for the, for the, vast part of the most part of the um of the period covered by last dance really so i kind that kind of passed me by a bit because i didn't have the money to have subscriptions to all sorts of uh, tv series tv um, streams that i would have would have needed to have followed that but i think what's been fascinating listening to that opening kind of exchange around the world is actually the breadth and the depth and the power of firstly the NBA and secondly Michael Jordan or maybe the other way around depending on how you put it to have to have built built the kind of the brand and uh, around the world in a pre-social media age so it would be interesting to hear what people's views are on on just how big he would be and just how you know how big the Chicago Bulls of of that period would be if it was now in the way that social media helps to amplify individual athlete brands and individual, you know, and team brands, you know, whereas what you just said about the Air Jordan brand, if it wasn't for Nike, you know, it could have, it, it, who knows, but, but these days it'd be interesting to get some views from people on that. Thanks, Tom. I'll go thoughts, points. Where does, where's that access point? Is it the, the brand of Jordan, the brand of Nike, the Jumpman, the uh, NBA, the sport. Where do we think the you know, the different access points are? There sort of regional or generational differentiations. And one thing I would like to kind of add into that, as um, as people think about answering, um, and it ties into I think what we've heard from Alex, Cynthia, and Harash is. Um, to what extent do we think Jordan being somewhat a relatively um, blank slate for others to kind of mirror, you know, their perceptions of him, to what extent does that play in here? You know, there's been certainly critiques about Jordan not being political in any way, shape or form. Um, and, you know, certainly what Alex was talking about in terms of, uh, you know, he had the attributes of, uh, of a king in a way that others did not, you know, how might that factor into this mix? Hmm. 
Gavin, can I rely on you to put your, your point about uh, cultural relations? Hello, can you hear me, Simon? <laughs> Certainly can, sir, those Welsh tones. <laughs> Um, no, just just from my perspective, Nike, Nike Air Jordans were a really cool and hip item to have at my school and certainly in most schools in South Wales, where I am at the moment in the UK. Um, I was more of an Adidas man, but, but certainly um, I think by virtue of the footwear, it was a sort of portal into basketball. Uh, I think people probably took a bit more interest in bas basketball as a result. And I think we also have to think about the fact that back in the 80s and 90s, traveling to the US was a bit more of a luxury than it has been in recent times. So um, I think it was sort of, there was a bit more of a mystique around the NBA within the UK, even though you could access it through TV, it was still sort of a, a long way away. So yeah, just a few points there. Thank you. Um, Shafi, please. Hello, can you hear me? You can indeed. Fabulous. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm from London, uh, born and raised here, uh, child in the 90s and um, yeah, my access point was for a lot of kids, obviously Space Jam and, and the movie itself um, and what's really, for me, he was someone on screen before he was a basketball player, which is extraordinary. Um, I'm thinking about, as myself, somebody who's a big football slash soccer fan, I'm just thinking about the parallels with the Premier League, um, and that was globalising as well at the same time. But, yeah, I mean, I still, you know, in that era, I guess there wasn't a soccer slash football player as at that pinnacle as, as Jordan was. And um, for me, that's, that's really interesting to look back on now. And you know, associate Jordan with the world of Hollywood, which is extraordinary. Mm. I think Space Jam has a lot to answer for in some regards, and we'll get to uh, revisit some of it with the second iteration of the film um, coming out, um, possibly uh, this later on in the summer. But it's certainly, you know, the, the, the multiple access points allows for a discourse, and to Lindsay's point of there being a... Um, uh, different ways of um, you know, reading Jordan. You know, there is a, uh, something of that, that blank slate capacity. Certainly then it makes an interesting dimension to where you can apply your own set of values and aspirations and, and hopes, um, certainly. Um, let, let's uh, move, thank you, Michelle, if you're a coin, perhaps to uh, the subcontinent, uh, to India. Amin Ban. Yeah, hi Sabun, how are you? Hi there, good, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, ju I just wanted to talk about, you know, uh, the Jordan's popularity in, in India. Not a not lot of people uh, realize that uh, basketball is quite popular in India. Um, and recently, in the Indiana Pacers uh, and, you know, even uh, Spurs had visited uh, Mumbai and played two games in Mumbai. And uh, we we do here uh, we do have a, a cult following, uh, especially with regards to a couple of teams here, and NBA has made quite a lot of footprints. Uh, I think I was born when uh, Jordan had his first uh, NBA title. So, uh, but after that, uh, we had we did follow, uh, even though lot, not a lot of things were shown in TV, uh, but our, I think post. 1998-2000, we started uh, having NBA uh, in ESPN in India, and lot of, and even uh, even in the school we we started uh, playing, and it it got quite a, a quite a lot of popular in India, and even now uh, people do follow a lot of teams uh, because uh, and also uh, just to remind you that in India uh, NBA comes in at around uh, five o'clock in the morning. So uh, we generally we wake up at five o'clock and to just to watch an NBA game. So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, post Jordan era has been really uh, huge in the impact of how basketball play, uh, popularity helped in India, especially NBA, uh, how they managed to take over that popularity and make sure that it connects with the people in India. Certainly, I wonder if there's a you know, the, the the icon within Indian sport 
you know, in a sort of almost contemporary, certainly in the start of it would have been Sashin Tendulkar. And I wonder if there's a, you know, useful parallel to be drawn, you know, to what extent did Tendulkar learn some of the lessons that um, Jordan, um, you know, provided in terms of, you know, this association with Nike, for example, um, being, you know, sort of apolitical to a degree, um, but, you know, just a mass, mass following within, within India, obviously. Yeah, um, I mean, definitely. Uh, Sachin, as you know, is a god-like figure in India, uh, similar to what Jordan is in basketball phase. Uh, but um, what we saw is also uh, Sachin uh, getting more um, attracted towards Michael Schumacher. Uh, you know, he was, he used to, you know, adore him. Uh, and he still is a big fan of F1. Uh, I, I don't see him much uh, getting into basketball, but he's definitely a, a huge fan of uh, F1. And, and, and obviously, as you know, uh, he has a huge cult following in the cricket space, uh, similar to what Jordan has in basketball. Okay, thanks so much. I wonder about the um, taking on um, the question uh, that Thomas uh, Hunt has posed uh, to us previously. Tom, are you, uh, would you like to articulate that one for Bob? Yeah, hi, hi Bob. Um, this is for, for Bob Edelman. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you're, because I don't speak Russian or any other um, languages that were, are, were used on the other side of the Iron Curtain, um, what was, if you have any insight, Jordan's impact on the other side of the, of the Iron Curtain, particularly in the 1980s um, during the era of Reagan, um, so I, I would be interested in hearing. Thanks. Okay. Bob Edelman. Um, I'm, I think I'm on. Can you guys see me? Hear me? What room are you in, Tom? <laughs> it's a virtual, virtual background. Ba but oh, God. I, have, uh, I have bad <laughs> curtains behind me. So okay, my, my, uh, technology. my virtual background is Moscow. I've been thinking about this uh, quite a bit. Um, and I was just talking with Alex uh, before we started about how I'd been to the Soviet Union and 1988 with the Atlanta Hawks. And um, I've always had a pretty close uh, relationship with Soviet basketball. My best friend uh, who I met during that tour became the uh, editor in chief of Sport Express, which is the national sports data that emerged in the last years of, last months really, of Pierre Stroika. So uh, part of what uh, they did in terms of the kind of, first of all, let's uh, kind of, can we throw out the Iron Curtain? One of the things I think we've learned, uh, I'm working on, as you know, I'm working on the Cold War and we've learned that the Cold War, and thanks for your efforts along those lines, by the way, uh, that the, the Iron Curtain was pretty osmotic. And one of the areas in which it was osmotic was not so much basketball, which was I think an important part of it, but obviously football. And so the predecessors of the Champions League are, that, are part of that. But um, in terms of media, right, in terms of Soviet, post-Soviet media, there was basically ice hockey and uh, football. And I think what uh, certainly was aided by uh, Jordan, but also even prior to that by Magic Johnson and Larry Bird and really the entire um, spectrum of, of basketball was making basketball, you know, a strong number three uh, in terms of what the perception was. So later on, um, you know, I, I was going to talk about this at the end, that uh, Jordan is a post-Cold uh, War person. And uh, so some of the attractions, I think, that uh, he... Uh, especially as branding, which is what we've been talking about a lot, we're not that different from the things that we've heard so far. And I just also wanted to say quickly that I'm scraping myself off the ceiling with how elated I am by you know, what I'm hearing today. And I'll save some of that. But, uh, you know, in terms of Jordan, he was the first among equals, but there's a rather extensive prehistory of the you know, Soviet interest in basketball, which is interesting, as some of you know, in terms of globalization, because so the Soviet Union was a kind of small mini globalization uh, project called, you know, with multiple nationalities. 
And so basketball in particular in the Soviet context was a multinational sport where the Baltic countries were very strong as you probably know. And so they were able to kind of uh, internationalize fairly easily uh, when, when Jordan came along. Thanks very much, Bob. I think it's a good point to make about the sort of transnational qualities that some uh, sports already have, and particularly within a political context of the Soviet Union and the what we would have termed the Eastern Bloc. Um, those, you know, connections were certainly evident, and you know, perhaps testament to the first generation of athletes who came out of that experience from the former Soviet states into the 1990s, which, you know. In by today's comparisons, perhaps not a lot of international players, but certainly in terms of uh, the environment of the 1990s, if you contrasted that with the 1970s or 1980s. Um, if we may, we're just going to bring in our second uh, round of uh, speakers. So I'd like to uh, turn over to uh, Professor Jean Williams um, for uh, her contribution. Jean, if we may. Hi there, yes, thank you. And, and thank you for the um, invitation. Um, I've been asked to speak on two issues. One is around um, Air Jordans, um, particularly interested in the history of, of sportswear and branding, and then to make some connections with football. So I'm going to start my comments around transcendence and Air Jordans. And in some senses, we have to know why now? Why has Netflix put the last dance out there? Um, and the narrative structure that is provided is that Michael Jordan owned his own labor uh, and therefore could endorse um, lucrative collaborations such as Air Jordan with, with Nike. Uh, in, in some senses, Air Jordan's made Nike as a company. Um, and The Last Dance presents us with a, a tragedy, in essence, in its narrative structure. It's Shakespearean in, in its shape. We see the rise of a talented young man to become the leading star of and an icon of the NBA as a franchise, promoting the sport of basketball worldwide, with scenes in Paris of the excitement generated by Jordan. Having risen to the height of his fame and sporting excellence, the tragedy is that Jordan owns his own labour, but not the means of production that makes his fame so valuable. The team owner, Jerry Reinsdorf, and CEO Jerry Krause have already decided to break up the team and not back Phil Jackson. The team achieves their target of the championship, um, but cannot overturn the owner's decision. And I think we have to think about the 1999 lockout, ind indicative of these industrial relations, and to some extent with parallels with what's happening to, to Colin Kaepernick. Um, Jordan may be able to promote the whole sport of basketball and earn a reported $40 million from endorsement endorsing Air Jordans, but he cannot overturn the decision of the owners. What he can do is earn even more money through endorsements than he can as a basketball player. So transcendence is the key message of Air Jordan, the product which achieves brilliant marketing strategy of selling not leather or polymer or even shoes, but the idea of air. Uh, it's what defines Air Jordans. Uh, they're by definition an aspirational product, uh, a wish for a better life, a way of escaping uh, a given situation. And described this way, Jordan's might seem like an entitled tragedy, but his persona as narrator of his own history in The Last Dance addresses that too. And I don't know if anybody else was so distracted by the cigar and the scotch, but what were they meant to symbolise all, all the way through? So what we see in Last Dance is not a retired basketball player, but an owner of several businesses, uh, including his own motorsport brand. He's a bit of a petrol head as well. So not only is he one of the most marketed sports people in history, but he owns his own labor and the means of production now. And that's the difference between Last Dance and um, the season that it covers. So in some senses, Last Dance as a program or a series of programs is redemption for that last season. It is literally Jordan's last word to those owners. Uh, moving on quickly to the collections with football, as, as we know in, in the history of um, sports clothing, uh, the Chuck Taylor All-Stars for Converse were among some of the, the first branded products um, to, to make the market, although tennis shoes have been popular from the 1870s onwards. 
in Britain, we've had a lot of um, footballers endorse their own um, uh, boots, from uh, Stanley Matthews to George Best. But the problem with football boots is that they have cleats or studs. And so they don't translate to streetwear in the same way that basketball shoes do um, until the advent in the UK, at least, of the training shoe. And again, like Gavin, I'm a, a huge um, Adidas fan. What was happening, though, in, in the 80s to, to Adidas, a brand which popularised itself through World Cups, which are not so important um, in America as they are in, in maybe Europe and Olympic Games, um, is that they were a family history that had been sold as a multinational. And Adidas today doesn't even own it, it, its own archive um, because of that family history. So the move to leisure wear has obviously got a much longer history. But those who bought Air Jordans in the UK from 1984 onwards did not want to be like Mike in the sense of playing transcendental basketball, but as something to be worn in the street as indicators, one, of Americanization, two, black culture, three, of entrepreneurship, and increasingly, increasingly allied with music such as rap. The political situation around the release of Air Jordans in the UK was that Margaret Thatcher's government had a bitter industrial relations with the miners, teachers and so on and so forth. And at the height of the strike, there were food banks, collections of money in the streets for miners and, and fights with police. So it was not an auspicious time to sell expensive sports clothing. But the idea of upward aspiration or yuppies was promoted by both Thatcher and Reaganomics. And in that sense, expensive trainers were part of that lifestyle. Thatcher, of course, did not like football fans. And so in some senses, Air Jordan stood against the things that football um, stood for. Uh, and retailing at over £100 in 1984, lots of kids were um, actually mugged for their Air Jordans. It started off a new wave of violence in the same way that we now see expensive mobile phones being used uh, in that. So it was a real statement of um, status and taste and an indication towards um, uh, US. Now it's very common if you, um, you, you, you may not spend a lot of time looking at um, Vogue or Harvey Nicks or Selfridges website, but it's really, really common now. No big brand, no designer brand from Gucci to Armani um, doesn't sell trainers. And these are $400, £400, £600 trainers. The style of basketball, high tops, is still very much part of that sports looks trend. Um, and interestingly, although there are now uh, connections between Air Jordan and PSG, so Air Jordan as a, a distinct entity are getting more and more into football, there's arguably no football player, I, I would argue even Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, and not even David Beckham, who has had the same range of endorsements as Michael Jordan as it's broadened out from the original shoes into clothing and a range of accessories. So uh, yeah, that idea of transcendence is particularly interesting in our given um, political situation, when of course, again, in both America and the UK, we have two of the most right governments that we've had since the Second World War. So this seems to me to be a, a real, um, closing of the circle in terms of why is this bill has been published, uh, been, been, been released now. Uh, and at the end of the day, of course, going back to my Shakespearean analogy, we don't see Michael Jordan as, as the young prince who dies. He actually has become the king and he's become the king of Reaganomics. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Jean. Appreciate that. I think the, the line around, you know, the Jordan brand being part of the uh, Americanization of globalization and the long discourse within you know uh, international relations studies or the extent to which globalization is merely a pseudonym for Americanization um, and the discourse back into what Americanization is as it becomes a more globalized society it's a fascinating fascinating part of this I think also the dimension of race which you pick up picked up on is something that um, we might return to um, I'd like to turn now to uh, Mr. Luke Jarman, a brand uh, expert. Luke. Hello, everybody. Uh, really, uh, thank you very much for um, uh, inviting me to be part of this um, 
I'm going to talk about uh, Michael Jordan and the Jordan brand from a from a pure branding uh, perspective, which is what my career has been. Like most, I'm drawn to success and the power of what can be achieved through hard work and dedication. And Michael Jordan was the embodiment of that spirit and transcended, as people have said, not just the basketball court, but also geographical regions to become this truly global phenomenon. And this was at a time when I was starting to be really engaged and influenced by sport. If you fast forward to the end of 2019, Jordan Brand had its first billion dollar quarter. And that was before ESPN's last dance was aired. So over the past 15 years, for me personally, I've been working in the sports industry, branding large scale sporting events. And I've seen firsthand the reach of Jordan across my time in the Middle East, South America and North America. Wherever I went, the Jordan brand was ubiquitous. The reach and impact was apparent and never too far away. As we know, athletes' endorsements and personal lines are common, but rarely anywhere near the level and success and reach as Jordan has achieved, which Gene has just uh, been, been highlighting as well. The Nike founder, Phil Knight, called the success of the Jordan Air Jordan 1 the perfect combination of a quality product, marketing, and, and athlete endorsement. But despite these factors, this success is not guaranteed for an athlete's brand. Many athletes over the years have tried and failed to make the leap from a star player to have an impact brand, and few have succeeded. Tiger Woods, Roger Federer, Usain Bolt are a few that have probably managed to match their success on their individual fields of play with their brand's commercial power. But in today's, today's connected world, even huge stars, global stars like Ronaldo, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, as you mentioned, and Lionel Messi, have struggled to have that same impact with their personal brands as they have on the football field. And even in Jordan's sport of basketball, the breakout global stars like LeBron James and Steph Curry have not yet created so-called super brands that have the fraction of the impact. This is partly due to the brands themselves being a little bit more savvy and a bit more aware of the possible negative connotations that a star player could bring. The high, most high profile example would be Tiger Woods and his troubles of the not too distant past. Michael, for his part, has been very savvy on this aspect, as we've heard, keeping a political and on political and cultural matters. And as Jordan supposedly once famously quipped, Republicans buy sneakers too. So what enabled both Michael Jordan and the Jumpman brand to become so huge and have the impact and reach that it did and continues to have? As outlined in Phil Knight's, Phil Knight's quote, there was a perfect combination of elements, including timing, which he didn't mention. But it was also helped having tastemakers such as Spike Lee, Sabrina Williams, and Barack Obama representing and amplifying the brand over the years. This has helped, as, again, as Gene mentioned, increase that cultural reach far beyond sports and introducing non-sports fans to the brand in hip hop, film, and youth culture in general. Jordan also benefited, we have to remember, from endorsements with other companies, companies like Coca-Cola and McDonald's, both global behemoths in their own right, and they saw the value in the Jordan brand and that helped amplify his brand. From a global commercial perspective, as uh, Alex alluded to in the opening statement, basketball's popularity and Jordan's popularity in countries like China, Japan, and across Europe has helped bring in the revenue over the years, something the NBA has been keen to capitalize on. This pop popularity led to the NBA hosting games around the world, and something that really took off in the 1990s, which is no real coincidence. The Jordan brand also now spends several sports, again, as Gene alluded to, including running, baseball, football, and even golf along with casual sneakers and clothes. The Air Jordan brand is now listed along Nike, the standalone brand, for example, and cross collaborations and, uh, and link ups, such as the recent Paris Germain and uh, Jordan collaboration that happened is a prime example. This has now been followed with Jordan Jumpman standalone pop-up shops and experiences that are far removed from those original Jordan shoes, but still embedded with everything Jordan has become known for. Despite sales waning slightly in the early to mid 2010s, they've surged back in the last couple of years, as I mentioned. It seems like Michael's never give, never give up attitude has been fused into the brand's DNA. It's not really surprising as Michael has been so influential on the shaping of the brand over the years, and the last dance will only continue that rise. In today's world of mass information and accessibility, will an athlete ever have the same impact as Jordan has globally? I personally doubt it. And just to finish, a quote from Jordan himself, in a 1998 New Yorker interview on Celebrity Impact, he said, it could easily be a matter of timing where society was looking for something positive, he said. It could easily be a sport that was gradually bursting out into the global awareness at the time when I was at the top. And then there's the connections I've had with corporate America since I started with Coca-Cola and then went to Nike, which has gone totally global. He finished, I really, really can't give you a sufficient answer.
Okay. Thank you very much, Luke and Jean. What do you think, therefore, uh, to open it up again to the broader conversation here about brand and wonder whether the um, you know different perspectives we could draw on from colleagues around the world. What did what is the the Jordan brand and its position in broader cultural society? Picking up on on Gavin's point about its experiences as a you know Welsh schoolboy and, and to a degree you know the the Roe family conversations. Where does the the cultural linkages come into you know the entertainment business to Hollywood to you know street uh, fashion to uh, where were those access points and, and what did Jordan contribute in that sense? I wonder if I asked how many people have at one point worn a pair of Michael Jordan shoes. Yeah. Lindsay, perhaps anything you could just. What did the the contribution make from your point of view? And I'm mindful I'm sat here wearing my uh, Jumpman T-shirt. I know. I had actually uh, I had wondered whether I should wear my own Jumpman logo, although it would also be cross branding with France, which for me is. Um, on brand, um, perhaps not for our audience today. Um, you know, I think this is a really great question in terms of, uh, you know, the part of the reason that we have today's global context um, in terms of globalization of basketball and the popularity um, that the NBA and the, the Jumpman um, brand itself is because, um, as uh, you know, several other people have pointed out, it's more than it's more than just it's about more than just basketball. It's an entire not just lifestyle but also identity. I recall back to a conversation we had with um, uh, the co-founders of All Parisian Games, Paul Adonat and um, Bakari Sako, who you know when we asked the question, you know what. What does basketball identity mean to you in terms of, you know, just kind of broadly speaking? Um, and they said the thing to understand is that it, it's a global identity, it's a global language, it's a way of belonging. Anywhere in the world that you go, you can, you, you can instantly connect with and commune with others based on not just playing basketball, but being part of this kind of basketball culture that goes from the shoes to the fashion, to the music, to the game, appreciating the game, even if you don't necessarily play the game. Um, and I think that's one of the interesting things, you know, as Jean mentioned, there's certainly uh, that, that um, similarity with football, but here I think the, the close connection with uh, the culture and especially the music um, and the fashion angle helps to set basketball a little bit apart when you think of um, branding in a global context. I wonder in that sense if there's something here around the uh, contribution that um, basketball and because of its cultural impact has in the diplomatic sphere and obviously that's the work that Lindsay and I have done as a part of a basketball uh, diplomacy project that we've been working on. Um, but you know, actually to, to other uh, colleagues here, you know, the basketball's ability to um, be a sort of transcendent, transcendental, uh, transnational uh, function of diplomacy is actually one of its, its greatest qualities, its ability to be interpreted in that sense. I wonder then maybe if, if we look at it in, in that regard, the national dimension of this and come to question um, that we've been uh, shared here around, you know, the role of national teams and the way that basketball has, uh, you know, some sense has gone beyond the NBA in Chicago and the last dance subjects and talk to the um, international uh, dimension the opportunity for countries other than the United States to win the world championships to compete for gold medals um, but again perhaps that stems from the experience of the uh, 1992 dream team and you know Jordan again has such a huge uh, role in that regard Right, and I wonder if we could route this question um, first to Alex and then ask other colleagues to kind of chime in, chime in with their, their own perspectives and takes from different parts of the world. But Alex, you know, you talked a lot a bit 
um, about the China connection and uh, Jordan and the NBA's popularity there and the very deep storied basketball tradition and culture that China already has in place. To what role does their national team though play in, in any of this? Yeah, no, it's, we talk, we talk a lot about access points and because basketball had that great tradition, Jordan could be grafted onto it really easily. You know, you constantly hear, oh, but we need it to be done with Chinese characteristics. Well, it so happened that Jordan and his personality and his spirit and, and, and this aura that he projected had something that the Chinese people could connect with. But the, the national team, it's funny, the, um, as patriotic as Chinese people may be, the national team is, is not the place where that gets expression. In fact, I remember talking to a Nike brand manager, Terry Rhodes, who was in China for years and was the guy who essentially cultivated Yao Ming to join Nike as a, as a leader. And he, he made the point that it, it's impossible to foist because the, the Chinese basketball consumer was so savvy and so exposed to the NBA, you could not foist anything that was below that standard on them. They were suspicious of it. They thought a fast one was being pulled on them. And as a result, somebody had to be as great as Yao Ming, had to go to the NBA and make it in the NBA before he could be reintroduced to China. And the Chinese league, the Chinese national team is considered this kind of inferior product. And for years, I love this anecdote because it, it shows the kind of market thinking that has been part of uh, Chinese culture for, for a century or more. But because China struggles so much on the international stage uh, with its national team and Chinese basketball apparatus was convinced it was because they just didn't have enough strong people and tall people, they introduced into the Chinese league a four point shot, figuring it would be an incentive to develop clever outside shooters and that was them. Uh, the advantage in international play, even more than they do in China. Um, but they've never had great success on the national team stage. Uh, and, and the NBA was just such a big foot that just suffocated everything in China um, until you had a little bit of a breakthrough with Yao Ming. Okay, thanks very much, Alex. I wonder if we could bring in uh, Edward uh, on this discussion. Hi, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm probably from, from Michigan today, but uh, my background, I'm half English and half Spanish so kind of my introduction to basketball was on the Spanish side of the country kind of a bit more engaged there and I was perhaps kind of too young to engage with with Jordan as an athlete at the time but sort of more that initial exposure was through a brand but the kind of key moment in terms of my introduction with basketball was the 2008 Olympics with the Redeem team and uh, the final with Spain and from kind of a Spanish perspective and, and perspective shared by kind of many in Spain that that chance, you know, for those who remember, a very competitive final and, and a lot of uh, Spaniards were really excited about that opportunity to challenge uh, the US national team. And it, it kind of shows a difference to, um, to, to the model of a lot of American sports where the league is, is a big brand and big sharing, but other countries don't engage in the same way, in my opinion, when you're kind of supporting a foreign league and watching a foreign league as when there are the chance for those international fixtures, which brings a deeper level of engagement, um, particularly in those cases and those years where the US national team has kind of taken it more seriously um, in terms of the, the athletes that they supply to that. And kind of just to tie it in with the brand discussion as well, I think those, those big events, whether it's Olympics or other kind of big international fixtures, extend a bit beyond the purely sporting event. If you look at who, tunes in and who participates and um, it's a kind of a broader culture so those represent opportunities to kind of push that brand outside of the um the kind of purely sporting domain so i think yeah that the international fixture side of it is is really important i think where a lot of american sports kind of could be doing more and isn't kind of traditional on their side to to get that international engagement is to to boost the the, the national team and those international fixtures yeah, I wonder if that's, a, as you know, and congratulations to your, your Spanish heritage for the uh, uh, championship last, uh, last year. I wonder if there's a link there around the, um, you know, different ways in which 
you know, Jordan can be attributed to the uh, globalizing function of or uh, asset of the NBA at this point. You know, the number of uh, international players in both volume and diversity has grown so much because of the point that every uh, you know that Jordan had that accessibility, whether you were in Spain or uh, elsewhere, all you know countries with lots of um, uh, you know basketball heritage within their own right, of course. But actually, being able to you know the reverence with which Jordan is held by current generation of international players, particularly as an access point, is certainly something that I think speaks to the uh, globalizing effect of um, Jordan, you know, from the 1990s uh, and through to today. I suppose that also ties into the uh, dimension of, you know, the soft power. Um, Joseph Nye's concept, much maligned uh, in some people's eyes, but nonetheless, has a real resonance within uh, this cultural space. I wonder, um, Peter, might you just uh, share a, a word or two on that? Yeah, thank you. I'm amazed that we are well into this conversation. Nobody has raised uh, Walter Lefebvre's book, uh, Michael Jordan and the New Global Capitalism, which uh, I think is a nice, slim, a uh, very teachable book. I have used it in my classes for years and uh, really was the first book that I remember of a diplomatic historian of you know, quite some renown tackling a sport topic and imbuing it with all sorts of significance beyond sports. And, uh, you know, just looking over the chapters now, I mean, some of the themes we've talked about are very much uh, the backbone of this book. Uh, the history of how basketball globalizes, of course, and how that sets up Jordan. Uh, the swooshification uh, of branding that he played such a big role in. Um, the perils of globalization. Uh, some of the dark sides, too, which the, the series did not really get into in a lot of detail. Uh, the Faustian bargain uh, of Jordan. and then. You know, the last chapter, the greatest endorser of the 20th century or an insidious form of imperialism. You know, a lot of these have, were dealt with in the book. And I'm curious uh, whether people have uh, read the book, what they think of it, if it's still useful and how The Last Dance maybe has uh, um, enabled us to think of Jordan uh, beyond what Lefebvre put out uh, almost 20 years ago. Because he, he saw him very much as kind of, you know, uh, a, a tool of kind of mick world if you want to put it yeah. that way i certainly think you know i can speak to to my experience and certainly it's been part of my uh, you know teaching and uh, reading for uh, you know a good number of years i think you know betraying uh heritage as a you know diplomatic historian of sorts you know lefebvre's critique of you know american imperialism the american age you know really you sort of comes to the fore i think in you know jordan and jordan becomes the personification of this idea of what americanization is and its role in the global uh, in in the rest of the world and i think in that sense you know lefebvre picks up on a number of the you know less amenable uh, qualities of uh, of that process um you know mcdonald's you know, the McDonald's of the 1980s was a different industrial and commercial beast than it is today. You know, the rain, you just look at the, the state of the menu and the uh, global health, uh, you know, crisis that is obesity and, you know, top level athletes. And it's a dilemma that, you know, many other organizations have faced, um, you know, the Premier League, the IOC. Um, but that, you know, perhaps... Uh, Jordan was a precursor to that in how his uh, portfolio of, of assets, as it were, or contracts were played out on that global stage. I certainly think there's something to that, but that's just uh, my two pennies worth. Other people's thoughts on that, perhaps? The commercial entity that is Michael Jordan? Hi Simon, could I could I speak to that? By all means, thank you. Um, I was just wondering what people thought of the fact Jordan was sort of involved in the production of this of this Netflix show and the importance of keeping that product line, um, you know, going and and the kind of control over the you know the content. 
what was shown, what wasn't shown. I mean, this is a bit before my time, I have to admit, so I don't know so much about um, what wasn't shown, but I, I'm, I'm just interested in kind of um, people's thoughts on the way that um, these brand lines are kind of protected and the way that perhaps the the way it was shown in the Lance dance was kind of a protected version of events. So that's a good point. The uh, you know continuing sales that Luke spoke to. Uh, Michelle, did you wish to come in on that? Yeah, I, I appreciate that comment, Jacob. I that was one of the things. Oh. That, hi, hi. <laughs> I'm I'm here from Central Pennsylvania. I'm yeah. a big fan of of LeBron James, so perhaps that color is what I'm about to say. Um, but I found his knowing his involvement in the production process as I watched every episode of Last Dance increasingly frustrating because to me it felt like this was a real attempt to try to to definitively lay down his take on history and his his interpretation of events and I just you know knowing that he really did have that final seal of approval made it for me a challenge to I was constantly battling my inner critic um, of him and and how the whole process played out would love to hear other people's thoughts on that too I think that really Indeed. plays in, you know the, the difficulties that we have in identifying a true set of values given this multi-channel um, you know, world in which we live in. And the flaps harks back to that, not so much halcyon age, but a different environment um, in terms of the um, 1990s where the social media dimension didn't allow for that discourse and that reinforcing um, bubble that we perhaps you know, are now perhaps uh, accustomed to. I certainly think it also plays to the, some of the values that we attribute to um, what we're looking at in terms of the uh, racial uh, dimension that we play to. We've got some hints of it in the, in the series and certainly within uh, the environment uh, that uh, you know, basketball is taking place. And I don't know if, if Nick, you might like to address your question about representation of players and coaches um, in this regard. Hi, Simon, thanks. Um, yeah, it just struck me. I mean, there's obviously lots of talk, as there is in uh, soccer in the UK, about the lack of black representation amongst coaches. There would seem to be an over-representation uh, amongst players in basketball. And it was in the context of, of, of SOAS, really. Is that, is that a paradox that you ha think has any impact on basketball as diplomacy in Africa? It was just an observation. Um, and the question I wanted to put. Thanks, Nick. I wonder if I can also bring in um, Jonathan, Jonathan Mandel's question here about uh, Mandela and basketball in Africa. Jonathan? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks um, for that. Uh, it's just fascinating to hear uh, everyone's views. And just also what struck me is, is obviously the global reach. And just if I can, before Mandela, just add that personal connection. So I grew up in Israel and, you know, without getting too political about the closeness of America and Israel, and I think Simon, you've alluded to the Americanization of, uh, of basketball in, in that sense, but um, Michael Jordan and, and Chicago and the NBA in general uh, were huge in Israel, but also I think the Olympics were a huge part of that. Uh, but one thing that hasn't been mentioned yet is media. And it's hard to believe, but in Israel, uh, up until 1990, there was one channel. And 91, 92, cable TV starts to kind of um, show up. And then suddenly we've got new channels and we've got sports channels and we've got dedicated um, programs. Uh, about the NBA and about Jordan, and then suddenly we see the finals broadcast live. So I think in terms of access points, which we've uh, mentioned before, that to me was huge. I mean, I was 13, 14, uh, 91, 92. So for someone growing up uh, in that age where um, TV suddenly starts to have all these exciting players and 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 things on TV, that was huge. And we also talked about social media. And I think that was really 
the first, perhaps, and I'm, I'm not definitively saying that, but perhaps that was the first time um, that we had uh, someone of, of a statue of Michael Jordan in the, in the pre-social media age. That was our social media, you know, the new TV channels. Um, but then you know, that'll be interesting to see what other people think of that. But back to, um, to Mandela, I was, I was just wondering, um, as I was thinking about it, that I wasn't, I couldn't really think of another uh, black individual that was as global as Michael Jordan. And I think the names that come up, Martin Luther King, uh, obviously Nelson Mandela, and in 1990, Mandela is released from prison. And I was just wondering, and also in drawing a line between basketball, diplomacy in Africa, and Jordan's ascent, uh, is it possible that Mandela had anything to do with the acceptance of Jordan as a black individual, um, and global and an influencer? Um, that That's kind of the two um the two main points that I was thinking about thank you Jonathan I wonder if uh, anyone like to jump in on that I've certainly got some thoughts but I'm mindful it's a discussion here Diana I'm happy to jump in on that one by all means Michael's question so one thing um that I think is really interesting if you look at the context of sport in the U.S and the plight of the African-American athlete. Um, this is something that's really embedded in our culture. We have had athletes such as Jesse Owens and Jackie Robinson um, and the Olympic track team of 1964 that had their protest um, on the podium when they won the gold medal. So I think that if you look at that context already, the black athlete on the international stage has played a big role. If you think if you think about Jesse Owens um, during those 1936 Berlin Olympic Games, he um, stood in the face of um, injustice and he already was setting the stage, I think, for further um, black athletes to, to have that voice. Um, and it's, it's kind of, I think, been embedded in, within our culture. And, and even looking um, today at some NBA athletes standing up um, for the Black Lives Matter movement um, or speaking out and, and being a political advocate, it's given them legitimacy as civil society actors, I think, within our context. Also given the central role and place of sport within the US context, I'm from the US, I'm from America. Um, so I may be a little bit biased, but I do believe that um, sport within this context has played a particular role. And then um, using these larger sporting events and games to kind of showcase um, that and use them as even a, a way to voice political views is, is part of it. Thanks, Biana. Um, James, I saw you had your, uh, were waving, um, turn over to, to you. So I started trying to get this one because working on the 70s, 60s, 70s, sort of the radical black athlete, and particularly the sort of global popularity of Muhammad Ali um, across not only Africa, but Asia, Latin America as well. Um, and then working into someone like Jordan as a global brand where Ali doesn't have a commercial brand per se, but is a sort of international actor and a, a global actor in the same sort of light as, as, as uh, Jordan. But then is Jordan then just the triumph of, of, as Tony Collins was pointing out with his words, sort of neoliberalism and Reaganism and the sort of Jordan is, is the American triumphalism is part of why he's so successful into the, into the 1990s, the sort of changing dynamics. Jesse Owens was always characterized as much more of a, um, a pro-American sort of diplomat when he went out. Um, then you have the radical black athlete and then perhaps moving towards the neoliberal athlete of the 1980s of the 1990s and maybe jordan i was just wondering if people have any opinions about whether you know sort of going back onto lefebvre's um book on that point is he just the is he just the side the right athlete for the times emerging um and a willing participant in that the brand controlling the brand and becoming the brand rather than being the the athlete or the person and particularly that's why with Jordan especially, um, we very rarely see who Michael Jordan is. So discussing, so having this documentary with him 
supposedly opening up um, was meant to be a big reveal. Uh, the amount of money that went into supposedly producing the documentary to get his rights, and then the amount of control he had and his friends and management team had over it would also suggest that this is not even the Jordan, um, the actual Jordan that exists. This is the Jordan, again, the brand that, that we're experiencing. Um, mm -hmm. And I just wonder about um, that sort of issues that Michael Jordan raises for us as a, as a sort of global athlete. Is this Jordan we're seeing at all? Thank you very much, Jane. Jamie, I think that really is a good point to sort of draw down on. To what extent is this only ever a reconstruction of, you know, the reality that um, Michael Jordan wants to present to us? But then in the in balancing that, the opportunity that, you know, globalization is only ever a constructed reality. And I think that um, contrast is perhaps, you know, complementarity even is actually one of the things that we can um, get to you know really think about and, and be part of the ongoing um, you know conversation thinking about where you know if we to release this you know um, in 10 years time you know what would Michael Jordan have been you know to a, a society in, in 10 years time is this a you know another drip in the you know continual brand awareness um, discussion that will mean that you know Jordan shoes will be sold you know long after the individuals you know passed from the world so I think these are you know really interesting points of how you sustain and debate and discuss and in some senses we're you know having this conversation perhaps complicit with the conversation um, here why is this fascination uh, so ongoing I wonder as we as we, as we draw to a, a conclusion because we do have other things to do in our lives. Um, I wonder if um, could turn over to to Bob Edelman um, to share a few thoughts uh, as we draw down, and then um, Lindsay and I uh, perhaps just a couple of words to wrap up. Bob, over to you. Uh, those are the notes I was taking, <laughs> thinking about the things that I was going to talk about, uh, but I'm kind of. You know, each new uh, intervention has made me think about something differently. So maybe I'll kind of raise this thing globally. I would actually like to talk about basketball, yep. which has been not, not featured in this conversation. Um, so uh, where to put it? I, I appreciated Alex's uh, you know, first comments and bringing it into the sort of historical context of, of China. And perhaps we can extrapolate that globally. But I mean, one of the things I got from Last Dance, which I did not like, I thought it was visually boring and repetitive. And then it kept rupturing the, you know, to the extent that there was chronology. So you didn't really get the sense of Gene's point of uh, moving towards the kind of tra ultimately tragic Shakespearean conclusion. Uh, so um, the other thing I got out of it and so those who sort of played basketball, you know, can see this is that just how great the player he was. I mean, he could do things that no one could do or do since, but there's a prehistory even to his game. You know, if you, there's basically, uh, he's Julius Irving with a jump shot, you know, and, and even before Julius Irving, there were people like Connie Hawkins and Elgin Baylor who played the same way, which was a black way of playing. And, you know, I think to uh, Michelle's point of view, you know, a LeBron James uh, portrays a notion of sport and politics and accepting and understanding what they're, you know, how they are implicated, you know, to, to Brianna's point. And um, <clears throat> to say that sports, uh, that Republicans buy shoes is another way of saying sports and politics don't mix. And if any of us in this chat believe that, we wouldn't be here at, for me early in the morning. <laughs> taking part in this exhilarating experience. So um, two things. First of all, uh, I've uh, before referenced before for this group, this 1988 tour to the Soviet, of the Soviet Union, the Atlanta Hawks, and David Stern was on that trip. And we got to know each other reasonably well, and I liked him a lot. Uh, more, more about in a second. But at that time, football was in big trouble, if you recall. And it looked like basketball was going to overtake uh, um, Football is the world's number one sport in terms of its kind of global presence. And that was very much uh, feeding the, uh, the sort of sense of mission that these folks, uh, abetted by Ted Turner, 
you know, and CNN and international news and all the rest of that stuff. CNN was in the hotels in, in the Soviet Union back in the day. That, uh, you know, this, this was what might happen. Well, we know how that worked out, you know, that football has gone on to greater strengths and become, you know, magnificently adaptable into the new world of, of, of uh, streaming and all the rest of it that we associate with progress. Uh, and basketball still, you know, does not have its standalone World Cup, you know, and that it's, it's not the, the, the competition that the Americans take uh, seriously. It's, that's the Olympic competition where, where reference was made to, the, you know, the position of national terms. And I would say that until it does, it's still going to be a number two and, you know, will not have the kind of global reach that, that football does, or maybe they shouldn't even inspire, aspire to. So I think I'll end on a, a moment of ambiguity. So, uh, so I'm uh, schmoozing with David Stern at the end of this, and I said, well, I'd really like when we all get back to uh, the US, I'd like to sit down with you and interview you and see what you, you know, what, how you are con contemplating this process of globalization that you're about to uh, uh, launch on. And he said, I'd be glad to do it just as soon as I figure it out what the hell I am doing. I think that was being disingenuous myself. Final note, uh, the dream team, right? Is the dream team even imaginable without the 1988 Soviet victory in basketball? That was the thing that led FIBA to uh, make the sport an open sport so that if you played on a professional team, you could now go back and play in the Olympics. I think that was a huge, enormous turning point. And so we have to, you know, look back at what are the things that were precipitating this. Could we imagine, I mean, there's this moment in the last dance where David Stern is very explicit about this, and that is the dream team spread uh, American culture throughout the world. It was a moment of capitalist triumphalism. And, uh, and that's in some of the, the uh, concepts of neoliberalism and this being the, you know, uh, Jordan being the sort of uh, emblem emblematic of Reaganism and Thatcherism, I think are apt. So uh, let me thank everybody uh, who has intervened. Uh, maybe that's not the right word. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks to uh, Adil and all the people who helped. And uh, I'm now going to go out and buy some Russian food. Un unmute, Simon. I will jump Thank on. Um, oh, Simon, you are there. Okay, go ahead. No, no, I was just passing it over to you, Lindsay. It's the baton. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> well. We will, we will try. Well, thank you so much for that, Bob. I think that's one of the key questions that has come up in a lot of our work on the intersection of basketball and diplomacy and basketball's globalization. Uh, you know, you, you talk to a lot of people in different parts of the world, and it certainly um, is this um, surging in terms of popularity, in terms of who, the number of people who are playing, who is playing uh, the, the sports, especially under the NBA umbrella. Uh, which is not all of basketball, the, the, the sports uh, consumption and increased mediatization and consumerization. But the question has always been, can basketball take over the world? This is something we pose in the context of basketball diplomacy in Africa with the NBA and FIBA's uh, Basketball Africa League, um, which kind of ties a lot of interesting points uh, together. Uh, but I think you're right. Until one of the world's biggest basketball playing countries takes the FIBA World Cup seriously and doesn't treat uh, the, you know, the Olympics as the only major uh, basketball global tournament, I think you know, the, the sports popularity will suffer until that point comes. Uh, I know that there have been a lot of efforts made by FIBA, um, particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis the 2019 World Cup to try to shine a greater spotlight on the World Cup, on the different teams involved in the World Cup history uh, to a North American audience. Uh, but I think you saw that the US team's participation, um, all the media that was here uh, in North America around the US team was 
perhaps not as um, positive or instilling a lot of viewer interest uh, to tune in um, as it could have been. Um, you know, will their performance, I think they, the U.S. wound up finishing in sixth or seventh place at the World Cup? Seventh? Yep. Um, knocked out of the uh, quarterfinals by France. Um, oh, right. <laughs> but I, I think that I, I oh, yeah. so but I think that will help to help to propel hopefully greater interest and participation both by U.S. players as well as uh, potentially a U.S. audience in the Basketball World Cup which will help to still stimulate everything um, so that that's kind of some of my top line thoughts I agree with you very much on that and I think the, the cultural aspect of basketball um, as a kind of global phenomenon uh, very much is building into this as well as the role that social media plays. I know that there was a lot of activity on the chat about social media and how it how it's global connectivity and the marketability of specific athletes and leagues and teams uh, have also fed into this. Um, so those are kind of my, my parting uh, thoughts, um, a lot of really interesting factors coming together here, many of which we haven't had the time to fully dig into in terms of race and politics, uh, the media uh, component certainly as well. Um, another time, another place, I suppose, as it were. Uh, but I've certainly learned a lot, especially hearing from uh, many international uh, colleagues on how a lot of this intersection of basketball culture, globalization um, is perceived uh, through their lens. So I thank you all very much for that. Um, it's been a really enlightening conversation on my part, including in the chat. Um, and I will pass the mic back to Simon. Okay. Thank you very much, Lindsay. And again, thank you to you and to Jacob, Ashika and Fadil for, for making this happen. Um, I would like to thank each and every one of you who's chosen to join us, wherever it may be in the, in the world that you are. Um, over 50 uh, people have contributed across those four continents and multiple time zones. I'm sure we could continue to talk about um, this for a long period of time. And in some senses, I'd be very welcome for that. We've got our Twitter handle, Jumpman Diplomacy. Please feel free to jump on that um, there's many things we could pick up um, you know within the context of the work we've been doing at SOAS in terms of sport and diplomacy please do uh, have a look at around the website and uh, the basketball diplomacy in Africa project that Lindsay and I have recently concluded has an oral history bank for uh, a number of uh, colleagues some who have been on this call to take part and, and uh, you know feel free to share that with students and colleagues and you know hopefully we can continue to build that and you know when BAL uh, does tip off um, whenever that may be as the circumstances allow we'll be able to uh, take that conversation forward um, I think we can uh, pat ourselves on the back or we'll give ourselves a high five and uh, you know, look forward to continuing the conversation. So thank you all very, very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Great. Thank Bye. you all. Thank you, guys. Bye. Cheers. Thanks. Thank Thanks everyone. Care. Take care. Bye. Thank you.